and uh, thanks krishna sir for giving me this opportunity so we'll move on to this topic uh, neuropathy recalcitrant to initial therapy so we'll quickly uh, go through this case the case goes like this he is a 63 year old uh, professor type 2 diabetes diagnosed 15 years ago fairly controlled with insulin he has early signs of retinopathy with a normal kidney function he developed a peripheral neuropathy a few months back and now he experiences burning uh, sensation and clumsiness in his foot his pain makes concentration and falling asleep difficult he was started on pregabalin 75 mg at night and later like uh, when he came after 15 days his uh, dose was increased because he was not feeling comfortable with the pregabalin pregabalin so it was increased to 150 mg and again he came back like uh, again he is complaining of pain so he was started on nortriptyline so this is how the typical neuropathy cases peripheral neuropathy the we are talking only about the diabetic sensory peripheral neuropathy how they present and how we start the treatment on so once we do that if the patient is not doing resp or responding to this line of management how else can we take forward this patient that is what the question is so uh, before uh, looking into whether the patient has got a typical sensory neuropathy of diabetes or not yesterday we discussed like even in kidney disease they can have non renal causes of uh, non diabetic causes of kidney disease so likewise in diabetic neuropathy also there can be other causes other than diabetes which can contribute to the diabetic neuropathy so please exclude the uh, things do a basic blood test rule out hiv do, rule out connective tissue disorders uh, rule out vasculitis rule out paraproteinemia simple electrophoresis will help us to rule out uh, paraproteinemia because the incidence the western literature says it is about 40% so rule out paraproteinemia rule out uh, alcohol uh, uh, dependence rule out renal failure so these things some are some of the things which we must rule out and also look into whether the patient has got only because of uh, diabetes or something else where there are some red flag signs are present so can we start them on medication or do we you need to really uh, refer them to a neurologist before uh, working up means whether the patient needs work up further before we start the medication so at the basic red flags that we need to rule out at that point of time when the patient comes is see whether the diabetic neuropathy is there asymmetry present or not the typical diabetic sensory peripheral neuropathy that we see in practice never presents with asymmetry there might be other causes of asymmetric neuropathy can be present in the given patient so he may have a, a truncal neuropathy he, ha he may have a mononeuropathy or a mononeuritis he may have other causes of uh, um, asymmetry but the typical diabetic peripheral neuropathy neuropathy that age dependent neuropathy never presents with an asymmetry there will not be any motor involvement so the mere presence of motor involvement in a patient warrants us to be seen by a neurologist at that point of time it will never present with an acute onset the patient will never come and say i'm having a pain since uh, uh, a week back 15 days back so he will never uh, uh, related with the time duration so if he comes and says i'm having neuropathy symptoms for the past to 15 days so look into the other causes so it could be a cidp or other things so it never presents with an acute onset and also rule out uh, whether any root involvement or a plexus involvement where uh, it might be presenting in a asymmetric way the motor functions might have been lost so uh, the uh, so we have to rule out the um, root involvement and the plexus involvement so having ruled out all these things the next thing that we typically tell our patient is control sugars so that is what we do but the literature there are lots of trials like from steno to uk pds has shown in a given type 1 diabetic i'm i'm uh, these studies have shown for type 2 diabetic in a type 1 diabetic the change in blood sugars may be associated with neuropathy so you control the sugars the neuropathy symptoms comes down so this is fairly good for a type 1 diabetic but in a type 2 diabetic it is not so the change in the blood sugar or control blood sugar is not going to help the patient like it is shown in this chart the moment you try to aggressively control the blood sugar there will be a worsening of the pain future so really a glycemic a good glycemic control may not be the need of the r at that time because the the neurons are embedded with sugars so you you try to make them to a, or you try to make them to a hypoxic state when the blood sugar comes down the patient will have worsening of the symptoms so we should not play a blame game also like your sugars are not getting uh, control that is why your neuropathy is not getting worsen uh, or improved so that is not what we have to tell our patients because the more you control the blood sugar he will have the worsening of the symptoms so we have to make a judiciously or Uh, we have to control it in a gradual way the blood sugars rather than like your hba1c target is 7 or 6.5 bring down the blood sugar in 3 months so such sort of acute over the night control of blood sugar is something which should not we should not do so the other thing which we need to uh, remember is giving vitamin b12 vitamin b12 might be something around uh, say less than 200 150 those are the things that might be warranting a treatment 
but we should also remember so whether to give a oral inject oral therapy or a injectable variation so in a normal uh, patient who visits us to our clinic it is fine whether we give a oral or intramuscular but what is important in the diabetic neuropathy is here there might be an associated b12 deficiency because metformin most of the patients are on so metformin competitively uh, uh, inhibits the absorption of b12 in the small intestine so even if you give oral therapy he may not respond to that oral therapy so give a course of uh, say you can give it alternative days or you can give it once a week or uh, make it two doses in a week so select a regimen and give 10 definite courses of vit uh, vitamin b12 supplement so that the neuropathy is not getting worsened with uh, b12 deficiency so having done these two things the next thing when we manage is the first thing that comes to our mind is so the timer is not running so uh, the next thing that we need to do is whether should we start the patient on pregabalin or gabapentin so both these drugs are extensively studied it doesn't make a big difference between pregabalin or gabapentin but gabapentin practically speaking it may work well compared to pregabalin because it is cost effective second thing you can start even at a very very small dose of 50 mg and next week because tablet gabapentin are available now for uh, in 100 mg so start a very small dose of 50 mg so next week you make them to take 100 mg next week 150 next week 200 so the compliance the acceptance of the patient will be improved as you start slow and gradually go and the patient also will stick to us so instead of starting the him on 300 mg so 300 mg bd you can give up to 2400 mg of gabapentin also or 600 mg of pregabalin so if you try to do it in a crash way the patient will develop side effects only so gabapentin scores over pregabalin because of the dose titration which we can do easily cost effectiveness and the side effects also if you see with gabapentin the side effects are much less compared to pregabalin but the huge randomized control trial are still showing it is as good as the other so you can choose between your confidence whether you want to do pregabalin or gabapentin the next drug that we can use in our clinical practices two drugs are US FDA approved one is uh, pregabalin the next is the uh, duloxetine so uh, diabetic peripheral neuropathy presents with a multiple of uh, uh, neurons there are many uh, sites where it, it can be addressed so one place where we can really go about this is usage of uh, SNRIs or tricyclic antidepressants so if you see the this is the 2015 article got published in Lancet the meta-analysis of all the studies for diabetic peripheral neuropathy is concerned so when you try to compare duloxetine with uh, pregabalin or gabapentin the uh, evidence shows be it any parameter that we use it is all the same so usage of duloxetine can be very simple you can give it in the daytime so diabetic peripheral neuropathy patients typically they complain of pain around 4 pm so uh, that is how they say their pain starts so start a drug at around uh, 12 o'clock so duloxetine can be given in the daytime 20 mg he will be very comfortable there won't be any side effect at all so it is not associated for the because of the reduction of anxiety or depression for peripheral neuropathy it works very well so start with the 20 mg and uh, up titrate to 30 mg then you can go to 20 mg bd 30 mg bd it can be gone up to 120 mg also and the acceptance is very very good when you try to do it with duloxetine so the first drug can be either a pregabalin gabapentin or it can be uh, duloxetine when you have chosen uh, either of this then nortriptyline or amitriptyline comes next between nortriptyline and amitriptyline the uh, pain relief as far as concerned it is better with amitriptyline but if the side effects the dryness of mouth other th those side effects are uh, less with nortriptyline so both efficacy wise they are all good so the important point that we need to know is suppose when we want to try a patient with duloxetine don't ever combine with tricyclic antidepressant don't this combination sh must be avoided because the side effect profile will be huge so you can com combine either a gabapentin with the duloxetine or a gabapentin or pregabalin with tricyclic antidepressants uh, duloxetine and tricyclic antidepressant should not be combined so here rests our patient where he was having pain so once we have done these two things what next can we do we all know about the topical therapies that are available and uh, capsaicin uh, treatment that is uh, 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 capsaicin as an ointment available but they are very very uh, uh, if you see the evidence they work in a very uh, limited subgroup of patients so what works better than uh, capsaicin as a uh, topical application is the capsaicin patches and the lidocaine patches they are very very good capsaicin is something like, like uh, the one which comes from the pepper extract and works extremely well so the capsaicin patches are very expensive it costs about it is available in mumbai if you want uh, they uh, import and give so they are cost about 80000 and it gives a pain relief for about 3 to 6 months once one application it relieves the pain for 6 months they are very very good but 
for a, for a, for a country like us, we can uh, rely on lignocaine patches. So lignocaine patches co cost about 300 rupees, but one thing that we need to use, uh, remember is, they, uh, each patch costs about 300 to 200 rupees it is available. So you have to, uh, the patient can use one patch for both the legs, but for a cost uh, constricted patient, they can just cut it and put it in half in both the legs also. But the most important point when we use the lignocaine patches is, it should not be owned for more than 12 hours, because tachyphylaxis happens. Lignocaine, if you continuously use, it will not work. So 12 hours they can use the patch and 12 hours they should not be, uh, they should be without the patch. So that is very, very important. You can use for three months, six months, one year. But 12 hours they should use, 12 hours they should not use. Uh, Lignocaine patches are very, very widely available in India. So these are all the first line drugs. So pregabalin, gabapentin, toloxidin, amitriptyline and uh, patches. So once we have done with this, what else can we give in our patient? So, so the second line of management is tramadol. So tramadol should not be combined with the typical paracetamol combination. No, that is not something which is uh, recommended. 100 mg con continuous uh, release tablets are available. You can start with a very low dose, so about 25 mg or so, because there will be associated nausea which is uh, prevalent in the patient. So use in a very, very low strength, then try to up rate even to 100 mg. But don't try to give 100 mg in a given patient because the acceptance will be uh, very, very poor if you give 100 mg. That we should remember. Also in a diabetic patient, so we should understand tramadol might be predisposed to hypoglycemia. So beware of, beware of hypoglycemia in these patients, especially in the patients who are admitted in the hospital. We have seen lots of tramadol uh, when it is given as a pain injection, they develop hypoglycemia, very well documented. So once we have done with the tramadol also, the other drug that we can use is anti-epileptics. Among the anti-epileptics, there are various drugs which are available. We can choose one among this. The problem with the anti-epileptics is it is not being tried in a good randomized control trials. So um, uh, the... Um, uh, they were not uh, um, um, studied in a placebo controlled uh, trials. These drugs were, were um, uh, also they were not studied based on compared to duloxetine or other things. So we can use this anti-epileptics, any of these drugs, of these four, we can choose one among these drugs and uh, based on our uh, confidence, we can use uh, anti-epileptics. The one thing that we need to remember is they are all predisposed to hyponatremia. So the side effect profile of uh, all these drugs, one, two, three, also will rem uh, mimic like hyponatremia. So in those cases, you have to um, uh, make sure that we measure the sodium at a, at a three months period or so. So that is something which we need to give. So first, first line, second line, opioids, third line, we have an anti-epileptics. So what to do next? So in case if the patient continues to have pain after these uh, uh, regimen, so what, what can we do next? Then comes intervention. Tense therapy is based on gate theory. So you, ha you have to simulate the bigger nerve to see that uh, small C fibers get uh, uh, doesn't get manifest the pain. So it is as simple as that. So TENS works very well, but only for a limited period of time. 10 days, 15 days, maximum one month, it will work. Beyond that, it will not work, but still you can use it for a very limited point of time. Epidural analgesia, no for uh, peripheral neuropathy. Sympathetic blockade, it came out in a big way, but it got a hit because uh, it was associated with the associated motor blockade also. So sympathetic blockade, we don't use. But sympathetic blockade can be used as a therapeutic regimen where a low dose of lignocaine can be used to see only sympathetic blockade happens on the day. So if sympathetic blockade happens, then you can take the patient for radio frequency denervation. So you, you uh, take the patient, it can be done under CM guidance. So it is a very simple procedure. Any pain clinic, uh, very go, many good places are doing, uh, Trichy, Coimto, Chennai, everywhere, Ramachandra, everywhere they are doing radio frequency abla uh, ablation. So the patient is uh, uh, under CM guidance, you see uh, the sympathetic ganglia alone being ablated with the radio frequency. And uh, there are many other modalities which have come in radio frequency ablation, where we can use a blast radio frequency ablation or a high frequency ablo uh, ablation, so that the paresthesia which are seen in the early things are also not being shown. And uh, the patient um, stays pain free for about six months with the radio frequency ablation. That is, that is the very up coming treatment and uh, it costs uh, anywhere between uh, 20,000 in a pain care center, in a small pain care center by a pain physician and uh, about 2 to 3 lakhs in a big corporate hospitals. So radio frequency denervation is something which is, which is very, very upcoming. So if the patient continues, once you have done radio frequency denervation also, if the patient continues to have pain, what else do we have? The state of art that stays last is neurostimulation. Where in neurostimulation, what they do, almost similar to a radio frequency ablation, but what they do is you get into the uh, epidural space, uh, thread a catheter, uh, put a um, um, microelectrode over those ganglions and try to place the other end of the um, uh, loops 
the catheters uh, between the thighs or in the lower abdomen. So you can stimulate externally whenever the patient comes. Like it is like an insulin pump. Whenever the patient uh, comes, uh, pain comes, he can stimulate it externally. So they are the state of art. Huge uh, articles are available, very well studied, but it costs about 20 lakh rupees for the patient. So very few centers are taking, even Apollo, uh, they, have, they are doing this for, for other conditions also. But if the patient continues to have peripheral neuropathy, this is the final thing where the patient may be landing. Uh, so this is something which we need to know. But in a resource poor setting, we can use opioids, morphine or codeine. Morphine is widely available now. It is not like 10 years back, like morphine is not accessible. Morphine is widely available. We can uh, start at a dose of 5 mg once or twice a day and uh, we can improve it. But please remember the patient may go for morphine dependence or he may be abusing. So if you don't know how to uh, take care of the uh, morphine uh, dosages or uh, preventing these things, refer to your pain physician or there are many good pain care centers. So where opioids can be given just because it is available, don't start the patient on morphine. So we can go by this step A approach. So this is the step A approach where you use pregabalin, gabapentin with the duloxetin with the tricyclic antidepressant, next tramadol, next anti-epileptics, then comes intervention, then opioids. So we can go give it in a stepwise fashion as shown over here. In case, if the patient is resistant, seen by 2-3 pain physicians or seen by 2-3 diabetologists and physicians, so in case if it is not coming, choose 3 or 4 drugs in this and start at one go. There is nothing wrong in that, not that uh, it should not be done. So 4 drugs or 5 drugs with a patch can be done and it is a very, very uh, recognized mode of treatment. Some of you who want to uh, uh, know more about this, like whatever we have discussed, this is an article which got published in uh, uh, two years back in Pain Journal, extremely good articles. Please go back and read this. This, uh, this gives the amazing information. So with this, I conclude and uh, thank for the chance. Thank you.